The RISE initiative, which stands for Reflect, Intervene, Speak, Engage, encourages our campus community to challenge assumptions about the role of class, race, gender identity, sexual orientation, religion, nationality, disability, and other aspects of identity. RISE is not an initiative that seeks to correct. It seeks to welcome. It seeks to inform. It seeks to explore. Most importantly, it represents the greatness of faculty, staff, and students, and alumni who call U Chicago their own and strive to delve into the complexities, tensions, and joys that diversity and excellence mean to us. That's why the committee welcomes you now to the first annual RISE Faculty Lecture on Diversity and Excellence given by Professor Adam Green. Professor Green was selected by the committee as a testament to the excellence of the UChicago faculty and the way in which they challenge students to contribute to scholarly and personal excellence in the classroom and beyond. Our institution is committed to the values of respect, free expression, and rigorous inquiry, things that are not bounded by four walls. The committee can think of no greater contribution to the tradition of this commitment than the RISE faculty lecture on diversity and excellence. It is now my pleasure to introduce Michelle Rasmussen, Dean of Students in the University. Thank you. My name is Michelle Rasmussen, and I am the Dean of Students in the University here at UChicago. It's my pleasure to introduce our inaugural speaker for the RISE Faculty Lecture on Diversity and Excellence, Adam Green. Adam is the Associate Professor in History and, a ma and Master of the Social Science Collegiate Division here at the University. Adam studied American history here at UChicago and earned his PhD from Yale. He's a faculty recipient of the prestigious Quantrell Award for Excellence in Undergraduate Teaching. Before Adam began teaching popular courses in urban history, comparative racial politics, and cultural economy, he authored Selling the Race, Culture and Community in Black Chicago, as well as Time Longer Than Rope, Studies in African American Activism. Professor Green has contributed to several acclaimed documentaries, including Brother Outsider, The Life of Bayard Rustin, Black Chicago from DuSable to Obama, and Slavery by Another Name. Finally, Professor Green is a regular contributor to the New York Times, WTTW, WBEZ, C-SPAN, and Al Jazeera English. From an early age, Professor Green realized that history is made by engaging in a series of everyday actions in ways that are familiar rather than remote. And he had an amazing example of living history in his father, Ernest Green, the eldest member of the historic Little Rock Nine, the nine courageous African-American students who risked their lives to attend Little Rock Central High School in 1957 and shouldered the burden of integrating a then segregated public school system. Their actions not only mobilized our nation to give all Americans access to a quality education, but also helped define the civil rights movement. Without any further delay, I would like to welcome our wonderful speaker, Professor Adam Green. Let me first say thank you to Kimberly McGee and Dean Rasmussen for those very kind words of introduction, both to myself and also to this initiative. I also want to thank the Student Faculty Staff Advisory Board for the RISE initiative. I'm very, very humbled by this invitation to give the first of these annual faculty lectures. I also want to thank Ellie Doherty, Vice President Coleman, and other senior leaders in the Office of Campus and Student Life. I'm grateful, as always, for your trust and collaboration in this event and in so many other worthwhile initiatives here on campus. And to others, many others, and many who I know gathered here tonight who help comprise this community of the University of Chicago, colleagues, students, neighbors, friends, 
I am indebted to you for your time, attention, interest in the proposition of discussing and exploring a deeper diversity. I look forward to your thoughts shortly in our general question and answer and also in the focused discussions that we are going to be having here at Reynolds Club after we are finished. But first, let me try to repay you your courtesy and your interest by sharing some thoughts about this important and often misunderstood topic. What's at stake when we discuss and debate and therefore enact the meaning of diversity within this community we call a university? What does it mean to connect it in a sentence on a poster to the standard of excellence? Who benefits with its flourishing and how? Who suffers from its absence and why? Diversity calls for societies characterized by pluralism, respect, access, all these universal aspirations, we suppose. So why do calls to advance it still prove controversial? I hope to speak to each of these questions this evening in keeping with the theme and the mission of the RISE initiative and to offer what I hope is something helpful to each of you as you make the most of your work and your presence here at this institution and also within the communities that it touches. But let me start with the last. Why do we argue about diversity when what it calls for at root seems beyond dispute? The short answer is that too often diversity compels a sense of anxiety rather than affirmation. The premise that we as people enjoy distinct histories, cleave to particular tastes, commitments, and loyalties, and advocate different and sometimes clashing agendas often seems destabilizing more so than collectively enriching. Those in the room under the age of 25 are perhaps too young to remember this, but I and others recall the numerous books that appeared in the early to mid-1990s, warning of what the eminent historian Arthur Schlesinger called the disuniting of America due to the rise of what he termed radical multiculturalism and the cult of ethnicity. Fifteen years on from when he wrote that book, we do find ourselves worrying about disunion in America, but in general due to our political dysfunction rather than any advocacy of diversity. Yet these charges retain validity today and fuel new disputes, whether over the civil status of children born of immigrants or the relationship of police and inner city communities or even the criteria for a legitimate presidency. Diversity, seen in this light, cannot help but touch off rancor and discord. We can see it at any touchdown point in the land of talk radio and TV punditry. And on frequent occasions, we see this in schools and campuses, including ours, where social differences emerge as a topic of campus-wide consideration following episodes of bias and sensitivity or heated encounter. For some time now, diversity, whether, the, whether in the school or within the media, has become something of a metaphor for politics, organized as a battle over scarce and still declining material and civil resources, or a contest over society's central offices, and therefore the authority to chart the course for nation and world in the 21st century. Now already, I imagine, some of you feel uneasy with what I am speaking about. Why well, speak about our everyday interactions, your everyday interactions, our feelings about ourselves and one another, your feelings about one or yourselves and one another, in terms of such high stakes. We do not ask that our actions, our choices, be held responsible for establishing the direction of the future or fueling the overheated conflicts of today. Well, this is very true, and this is fundamentally right. Yet this is what happens inevitably, I believe, when we approach the meaning of diversity in terms of interests. When we think about differences among people in terms of what we imagine, what we fear, others want, it becomes difficult to avoid seeing human difference as anything other than the predicate of social and political conflict. This can prove true within a classroom, at a dormitory, or across the street separating members of a fraternity from passers-by. 
It can also prove true when more tangible differences in educational opportunities, health services, or occupational chances are considered. In comparing the life chances afforded those enrolled and working at this university with those who live nearby but are not yet part of this university. We always need to remember that some arguments are important to have because of the ways in which they clarify the applicable standard of social responsibility and justice as well as the conditions of coexistence tying institution to community and the groups of people that comprise each. And while understandings of this standard in particular do diverge between members of the campus community and between the university and its neighbors, there should be no question of the validity of those who question or criticize official positions or policies enjoying and retaining a right to speak their positions along responsible lines. Freedom of speech stands as a core value in this institution, which has done so much over its history to promote and nurture freedom of investigation and inquiry. What I want to concentrate on, though, this evening concerns an earlier point, concerns the tendency to base our understandings of the stakes of diversity to expressed political interests. In some ways, I think this is unavoidable, given both the present, the very contentious, the very rancorous present in which we have these conversations taking place today, as well as the pasts that these various conversations and these activities reference. While this is all true, I find this state of affairs to be less than ideal in terms of considering what we can do with the idea, the premise, the project of diversity. What I want to propose then tonight, and what I want to suggest as a starting point for our discussions, both tonight and going forward, is what might change if we thought about the claims and thought about the meaning of diversity in relation to values rather than interests. I suggest this approach because I think it both renovates and fortifies the meaning of diversity from an unsatisfying riff on tolerance or congenial coexistence to something more meaty, something more substantive, something more consequential. The rap against diversity is that it results in the abandonment of shared values. The best way to counter this, it seems to me, is to make an alternate virtue of sharing values rather than mandating that the only worthwhile values are already shared which usually means imposed on newcomers according to already existing norms. Of course, this happens most effectively in societies where foundational normative supervalues span the totality of those societies in terms of their civil composition, rights-oriented constitutions, for example, or religious freedom, or a dedication to the equality and the development of girls and women. Yet even these societies need improvement when those supervalues can find themselves enriched and transformed by the insistent intervention of the formerly marginal and disenfranchised, often through struggle. In the specific case of the United States, for instance, it is difficult to imagine a credible democratic tradition that we could speak of today in any way without the expansion of civil rights that were won by racial minorities and women through multi-generational programs of movement struggle. But I think understanding diversity in relation to values rather than interests not only constitutes a more substantive defense of it in response to critics, I also think that conceiving of diversity in relation to values, indeed as a value in and of itself, also makes it more compelling to its advocates, or rather, it's many less, often less than enthusiastic constituents. Because diversity is often seen to involve little more than gentle prods to coexist in ways that do little to revisit and potentially remake structuring norms, it elicits little enthusiasm and less loyalty. I believe it deserves better and can serve as a much more robust ethic of cultural education and community building were we to invest it with the requisite substance. <clears throat> 
What I'd like to do then for the remainder of my remarks is to suggest some ways in which this might be achieved using the language of values. First, we can think about a range of different ways in which we would imagine specific values that we would associate with diversity. Um, for instance, Kimberly brought up respect in relation to thinking about the ways in which the capacity for people to really exist in some sense of plausible equity involves a co-regard for one another. We could think about terms like affirmation as a cognate of that, dignity as a cognate of that. We could think about the ways in which veneration of individuals within groups and communities through a heritage of struggle, sacrifice, work, leadership is important in terms of thinking about affirming diversity. And we can think about justice in relation to the ways in which communities often trying to establish a plausible sense of diversity fight and struggle for some tangible, some structured, some enduring sense of equity. But I want to use a word that I think often people do not associate with diversity, and one that I think cuts across the presumed political valence of the term. And that is the term, which I take as a value, of tradition. It's ironic when we think about it that while diversity is often characterized as a liberal project of pluralism, of secularism, even relativism, that much of what we actually experience in relation to diversity involves very deep commitments to conserving, to passing along, and to restoring a sense of traditional and established culture. This corresponds in an interesting way to what we think of as some of the key precepts of a more original conservatism rather than a more original progressivism or certainly radicalism in terms of understanding the ways in which early, in terms of conservative thought during the Enlightenment, many of its strongest advocates were deeply dedicated to the idea that peoples, not just a unitary or superior people, but all peoples, bore a responsibility, had an opportunity, and had an obligation to conserve their highest conditions of cultural accomplishment. This is one of the reasons why, for example, the conservative thinker Edmund Burke, among the key progenitors of classical conservatism, was at the same time a steadfast critic of early British and multinational imperialism around the world, one of the strongest critics, in fact, in relation to things like the Dutch East India Company, in relation to the emergence of colonization, particularly within India during the early 19th century. I'm struck by the ways in which this sort of sequestered, secret, conserving aspect of diversity is present in many of the activities that I've seen some of you take part in. For example, the community night festivities and events that take place during the annual Martin Luther King Day celebration. Think about the ways in which performance, engagement in terms of the conditions or the traditions of a particular culture requires a deep sense of study, a deep sense of practice, a deep sense of collaboration, and a seriousness in terms of what it means to bring that tradition and hold it together and present it and share it with other people. In that sense, I think diversity is something that we need to understand in terms of having a range of different political valences. It is not a conservative project, but it draws in many ways off of a deep conservative instinct in terms of thinking about how people need to be grounded in a sense of their own traditions. This is something that actually has personal importance to me. Because when I think about the ways in which I've come now as a much older individual, a mature individual, someone who has a position of responsibility within this community, to a sense of that being grounded in what I understand to be the tradition of both African American struggle and the tradition of African American thought, African American knowledge, and African American self-image. The ways in which that came to me, initially, most powerfully, 
was during graduate school, and it had to do with reading a book that many of you I know are familiar with, which was W.B. Du Bois's Souls of Black Folk. A radical book in its impact, but a book that actually was profoundly engaged with the conservative project of finding a way to reconstruct the African-American tradition. Think about the chapters and the ways in which a sense of African-American culture is recovered at a time of great denigration in relation to the ways in which people thought of African-Americans as a people without tradition, without history, without culture, without thought. And going through that book, initially as a graduate student, later as a teacher, and eventually as a professor, finding ways in which thinking about that work and that intervention pointed out how diversity is something that needs to be thought about in terms of the responsibility of upholding traditions at the same time that one is trying to convene diverse and multicultural communities. That sense that tradition needs a seat at the table in order for diversity to thrive is both something I think that underscores the consequence of what people bring, the substance, the meatiness of what people bring when they come together in a community where there is in fact mutual regard and mutual respect for one another and where one comes from. But it also underscores the responsibility not just of the people that encounter that difference, have to regard with respect the culture of another, but it underscores the responsibility of those that would carry that culture, the seriousness of participating within diversity. Again, recall my point that one of the things that I think makes diversity less than compelling to many of us is the sense that there's not much asked for us in order to be able to participate in it. If we take seriously, though, the value of tradition and what it means to engage a tradition and build various agendas, including the agenda of struggle in some cases, on tradition as an extension of affirming people, we have a sense of the ways in which diversity can actually be much more consequential. Another value, and a complicated one, to bring up in relation to diversity, and it works off of this idea of what it means to be responsible to tradition, is something that I call forthrightness and, the, and a fidelity to the facts of one's tradition. And this, I think, underscores a sense, again, of the responsibility not only to those who encounter difference, who see something that they're not familiar with, and are obliged to take it seriously, because those are the conditions of respect within a community such as this one. It also underscores the responsibility of those that would carry forward that tradition, that would speak in its name. There are many ways in which diversity is strongest and at the same time perhaps most difficult to engage and to deal with when people are making claims of moral authority, even moral righteousness, in relation to the ways in which they're speaking about various positions. This is an important part of taking seriously what it means to think about coexistence across lines and categories of human difference. But also, at the same time that one marshals that sense of moral righteousness, one needs to also have an appreciation of a sense of proportion, a grounding sense of modesty, a sense of responsibility not only to oneself and one's own dignity, but the other people who have come before one, the other people that comprise a tradition that one is extending, the other individuals that have claims to the same sorts of concerns, the same kinds of aspirations that one is invoking when one is speaking in relation to one's group. I appreciated very much that Dean Rasmussen mentioned my father in relation to thinking about my own formation, my own sense of self in the world. And for me, there's both a sense of certainly pride, um, a sense of great veneration in relation to both what he's done and what he's been as an individual, as a man, as an adult, as an important leader since he left high school. But I also feel a deep sense of responsibility in terms of thinking about what he had to endure in relation to making that kind of contribution that justly has a historical stature. And what then are the responsibilities of invoking that tradition in order to advance claims that I might align myself with or I might introduce in relation to the spaces I find myself in. Diversity can be very serious business. 
in relation to thinking about what is the basis of making the claims that come up at different moments in time. And that leads me to share a second memory of mine. And I thought a lot about this over the weekend in terms of putting these remarks together, but I felt like this would be important in terms of really cutting to an edge in terms of thinking about these conversations, drawing distinctions not only on the ways in which we have to embrace difference, but think responsibly about what it means to invoke difference. And this other episode, which actually involves a media clip that I think many of you, once you see it, will be familiar with, but perhaps some of you have not seen for a very long time. Maybe some of you have never seen, but only heard of. This episode is the Clarence Thomas Anita Hill hearings of 1991. And I share it because I think this, for me, You'll ask people who are older sometimes to talk about a moment in which their views of the world clarified, sometimes by sort of making everything very simple, very obvious, sometimes by revealing the inescapable complexity of the conditions in which we live. And for me, watching, and I did watch all throughout the Clarence Thomas and Anita Hill hearings, was a moment that underscored more than any other up until my life at that point the second category, the ways in which I had to attend to the truth of the complexity of some of these categories. I'll just give a brief thumbnail in relation to recalling some of the particulars of the hearing. Of course, uh, Judge Thomas, who at that point um, had moved on from government service to a position within an appellate court, was nominated on July 1st, 1991 to be a justice on the Supreme Court to replace the retiring Thurgood Marshall the only African-American justice who had sat on the court. Thomas, of course, is the only other African-American justice to sit on the Supreme Court. Immediately, the proposal to put Thomas forward by a Republican administration headed by George H.W. Uh, Bush was seen as very controversial, given the views and given the positions that Clarence Thomas had presented in terms of a very conservative stance on affirmative action, a conservative stance more generally on state and government responsibility in terms of ameliorating inequities in occupation and education, the treatment of women, the provision of resources to different groups, and so forth. Justice Thomas went ahead and was brought forward in September uh, before the Senate Judiciary Committee, which is the general sort of uh, protocol in relation to confirmation of Supreme Court justices, as many of you know. And although there was a great deal of contention during the hearings, by and large, he was able to navigate that process and was poised to win confirmation by the time that October rolled around. And then dramatically, very dramatically, it was disclosed that documents had been leaked to the press of interviews with a staffer at the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission and the Department of Education named Anita Hill, now a law professor at Brandeis University, alleging that Clarence Thomas had engaged in serial, wanton, and extraordinary acts of sexual harassment. The day in particular in question, and you can actually see Virtually all of the testimony that was given that day through access to YouTube or access to different news sites. The testimony that day went through the entire day. Clarence Thomas gave a statement of about a half an hour and there were various engagements in terms of members on both sides, both party sides of the aisle of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Uh, at that point, a recess was called and Anita Hill was called in to testify for several hours, actually, in relation to her allegations, and she was questioned by multiple members from both parties. And then Clarence Thomas, uh, Judge Thomas, came back in, uh, claiming that he had not heard the testimony, and we have no reason necessarily to believe that it wasn't the case, but wanting to speak in general to what he understood to be the substance of that testimony and in order to restore his sense of his own good name and his perspective on the proceedings that took place. And this is the minute and a half or so that I want to play for you and then speak to afterwards. So if I could cue up that, uh, that uh, video clip, please. Thank you. The Supreme Court is not worth it. No job is worth it. I'm not here for that. I'm here for my name, my family, my life, and my integrity. I think something is dreadfully wrong with this country when any person, 
any person in this free country would be subjected to this. This is not a closed room. There was an FBI investigation. This is not an opportunity to talk about difficult matters privately or in a closed environment. This is a circus. It's a national disgrace. And from my standpoint, as a black American, as far as I'm concerned, it is a high-tech lynching for uppity blacks who in any way deign to think for themselves, to do for themselves, to have different ideas. And it is a message that unless you kowtow to an old order, this is what will happen to you. You will be lynched, destroyed, caricatured by a committee of the US, US Senate rather than hung from a tree. So in playing this, I'm not bringing this up to dispute or raise questions about Thomas's presence on the Supreme Court. That's for other bodies. That's for individuals. I don't think that that's necessarily relevant, particularly to thinking about the conditions around values that I'm bringing up in terms of diversity. I'm not even necessarily in playing this clip trying to raise questions, though you may, in relation to the discussions that you have about the ways in which Thomas marshals a sense of righteousness and outrage in relation to his perception of how he was treated. What I am bringing up here, though, is what it means precisely, what it meant precisely, and what we should take from the fact that just Judge Thomas invoked a sense of tradition of oppression in terms of characterizing the particular sense of offense that he was experiencing that day as a result of the proceedings of the Senate Judiciary Committee. To speak about himself as someone who is the victim of a high-tech lynching, for instance, is of course to invoke a very serious tradition, one that obviously speaks to those African Americans denied the most basic right, the right of life, the right of bodily sanctity, the right of not being defiled by assailants and those that would assault them. And also to invoke that larger tradition of racial violence, to invoke that larger sense of being a victim once again of the ways in which powers that be oppress those that are at the margins, is at the same time to render invisible a different category of oppression, as I know many of you recognize. And that is the category of oppression also violent, also soul killing, also body injuring, of sexual violence against African-American women. And one of the reasons why this stayed with me as much as it has over my life in terms of something that needs to be pointed to as an object lesson of the obligation to be responsible, to think seriously about what it means to carry on traditions within diversity, was the way in which afterwards, as this hearing progressed, it became much more an inquest, an inquiry, even a trial, into whether or not Anita Hill was someone who had standing to raise the concerns that she did than an inquest or an inquiry into whether or not Judge Thomas had the standing to actually stand as a candidate for the Supreme Court. And that, I think, is probably the single most important reason why Judge Thomas is now Justice Thomas and this case remains one that is difficult to understand the facts of, and we will probably never get to a point where we fully have resolution or closure in terms of what we understand to be those facts. So for me, this underscores the importance of thinking about responsibility, not just responsibility in relation to representing a tradition, but responsibility to a standard of knowledge, a standard of fidelity to the truth of those traditions, and responsibility to a sense of honesty in relation to those traditions. I've seen so many instances, whether it's students in classes, whether it's cultural performances, whether it's engagement in relation to various political or advocacy groups or participation in protest, where students have taken up that responsibility of being forthright, being truthful, engaging themselves responsibly in relation to those traditions strongly 
What I would ask you to do going forward in terms of making diversity more substantial, making diversity more consequential, is to invoke that seriousness in terms of finding ways to say that living within a diverse community is about the ways in which we take each other seriously rather than the ways in which we casually engage and sample one another's cultures. There are traditions behind this. There's serious work and commitment behind this. And I think that you are in a position to invoke this much more than any of us do within society. Finally, the ways in which diversity needs to be thought about as a basis of exchange and exchange as something that can be understood as having mutual benefit rather than specific, personal, or situated benefit. Another book that was very prominent during the late 1990s was a book written by two former college presidents, Derek Bach and William Bowen from uh, Harvard and Princeton, respectively. William Bowen, by that time, was also the, uh, the president of the Mellon Foundation. And in preparation for the book that they wrote, Making a Case on Behalf of Retaining and Strengthening Affirmative Action Within Higher Education, The Shape of the River, published in 1998, William Bowen drew on a rather extraordinary study, which I would recommend to all of you to look at, either through this work or through the archived data that is available through the web, called the College and Beyond Survey. Compiled in 1994, this was a survey of some 90,000 graduates from 34 separate institutions, drawn over about a 10 or 20 year period. And this was the main data source for this book, The Shape of the River, that I spoke about before. And one of the most striking statistics in relation to the argument in this book, more generally around diversity, were the ways in which students, not only African American, but also white, saw what was called the ability to work effectively and to get along with people of different races and cultures as a foundational aspect of their educational experience. 42% of whites, for instance, from the class of 1976, surveyed in the mid-1990s, believe that to be absolutely integral to their experience of going to a higher education institution. 55% of whites who came from the class of 1989 believe that. Perhaps even more striking were the even greater numbers of African Americans who found this to be absolutely foundational to what had made their college experiences worthwhile, 74% for the class of 76, 76% for the class of 1989. And these are figures that actually correlate and indeed have in, increased to some degree in terms of thinking about similar surveys today, although there has not been a survey done of the same sort of scale as this college and beyond survey that the Mellon Foundation undertook. And I'm struck in terms of thinking about this point at a point that my father has often shared with me, both as a student and also as someone who works as a professional within various institutions of higher education. He spoke about the ways in which for him, the experience of going to Little Rock Central High School in 1957 and 1958 was perhaps the most alienating experience that you could ever imagine. When he received his diploma, for instance, the only African American to graduate that year, the applause stopped and nobody said a word. And he walked up, received his degree, and walked off the stage. All throughout the course of the year, he found himself shunned, turned away from, not engaged by other students, not so much because each and every one of the white students that he encountered was an inveterate racist, but many of those students who might have wanted to engage with him were scared about what those students who were racist or what those community members who were racist would do to those who actually engaged with those African-American students. It was a deeply isolating experience. And yet, each and every time my father has talked about what is the greatest benefit in terms of being in a situation of higher education, a campus in which people are coming from a number of areas, time and again, whether he's speaking to students in high schools, whether he's speaking to students in college, whether he's speaking to me, he talks about the imperative, the priority of reaching out and engaging people in other groups, because it's one of the only places in which one is going to be fully free to be able to do that. Much harder to do in adulthood, much harder to do in the kinds of communities that we find ourselves living in that increasingly are resegregating, 
much harder to do when you place your children in schools that are becoming even more segregated in some cases than they were in the 1950s. So it's not meant to rosily sort of celebrate what it is that one can do in a university. It's taking seriously that this is one of the spaces in which that's relatively easy and relatively encouraged and relatively enabled. And it's important to take up that opportunity. So in closing, I just want to come back to the main point that I was saying before, which is that one of the ways I think we can find a way to take this idea of diversity and make it something that means more to us, that is more effective as a device, that gives us more of a way of recognizing ourselves as well as thinking about ourselves in the light of other norms, is to think about diversity in relation to our values, whatever those values are, religious, in relation to sexuality, in relation to thinking about political orientation, in relation to thinking about racial heritage. Because the more that we understand and the more that we think about it in the way that the general culture understands diversity in terms of what's in it for you, what's going to promote your interests, the more in which I think that becomes a difficult category to truly seize and try to make something of. Thank you very much, and I look forward to questions. Um, hi, my name is Henry. I'm a third year history major. Um, you talked about the formative role of the college experience in being exposed to different kinds of cultures, identities, values, etc. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts on the role the active positive role that the university could have besides just students engaging on their own free will. Um, what do you think the modern urban university should do in regards to advancing diversity, especially to those who aren't here today, who aren't willing to come to the table out of their own free will? Sure. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, it's called the university for a reason in terms of thinking about the ways in which a diversity of ideas, a diversity of perspectives, a diversity of approach, approaches coexist within one area. So you will get a different answer from different people depending on who it is that you ask. I would say that one of the things certainly that any university, and I would say especially this university, needs to have in mind always is the sustainability of itself in relation to the communities that exists within. In some cases, that's something that has to be thought about in fiscal terms. In some cases, that's something that has to be thought about in relation to notions of campus safety. In many cases, that's something that has to be thought about in terms of trust, goodwill, and a sense of correspondence and co-recognition in relation to a university and surrounding communities as neighbors. It's not a newsflash, and certainly I would be betraying my credentials as a historian to say that the University of Chicago has not always had a great history in relation to those questions. And I think this institution particularly always needs to think about how to understand the ways in which how it's perceived today is partly determined by the ways in which it operated in an earlier period historically. And I think there are many things that are done by this university to try to address that. I think there are many other things that this university needs to continue to think about doing. And one thing that I would say, which I don't think is necessarily out of line with a range of other people, including you know, my colleagues Karen and Ellie and others within campus and student life, is that students not only play an important part in relation to serving as advocates, engaging with different people within communities, trying to find ways to build various bridges and operate in solidarity, but students play a vital role in terms of serving as critics within this institution. They remind us, they point out things that are not working well, and they propose, I think increasingly, much more so than when I was a student here back in the 1980s, they propose ways in which it could be done better. And that is also part of what it means to be within a university, is to find ways to draw on the value of that kind of work, that sort of diversity. So I hope that's an answer in relation to your question. There's much more to say about that, obviously. And I think in some ways, many of, the, many of those points are important ones to try to share within the small groups, and there'll be other people that will be there to engage with it. Other questions? Uh, first, thank you for speaking. I found your speech very thought-provoking. So my question is involving, uh, I guess, the way in which you uh, 
sort of laid out your speech with certain focal points and terms like tradition, like exchange, but I found woven throughout all of those was the term responsibility. So how do you see responsibility specifically as it applies to diversity and as it relates to all of those uh, terms in which you talked about? And where is that term of responsibility? Simply that we have to take it seriously. And simply that we have to think about it as, as I tried to say at the end, a place in which we can see our best selves, the selves that we want to realize and enact, presented, reflected, captured, as opposed to a place in which we imagine ourselves being diminished as a result of operating within that. And so in that sense, I think being responsible about the, the substance, the value, the the effectiveness, the utility of the traditions that we find ourselves coming from is, in a sense, I think, in and of itself, the, the very definition of what it means to be responsible in relation to thinking about how you engage with other people. It doesn't mean you have to be serious all the time. It doesn't mean that you have to have an agenda and a sense of pitch struggle each and every time you have an encounter with another person. But it does mean that you are rooted not only in a sense of an understanding of where it is that you come from. And if that understanding, as was certainly the case for me in relation to thinking about how I imagined myself as a college undergraduate when I was here at the University of Chicago in the 1980s, there were many, many things, many things I had yet to learn about how to understand the tradition of where I came from. But if you're committed to learning that, and if you have a sense of the ways in which what you are doing is rooted back in what others have done before you and still others are going to do after you're coming in, then I think immediately you take yourself sufficiently seriously that you will act in responsible ways. Responsible in certain senses to the institution, but I think even more importantly, responsible to yourself in terms of understanding what it is that you want to achieve why it is that you're trying to work in relation to other people. One question I had was this concern about diversity and trying to make it a larger value. For example, you mentioned her as conservative, mm -hmm. but I think it also plays into a West, uh, like, dare I say, Western conception mm -hmm. of what universal values are and how we transcend those values. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question would be, and maybe this is slightly blasphemous at a Western university, especially one like the University of Chicago where the classics are so emphasized. It's a secular university, so blasphemy is perfectly welcome. <laughs> But I guess I was wondering, and if you'll also excuse the pun, if there's any value in placing diversity outside of the context of, I guess, what would usually be called these timeless universal sure. truths or essential contexts. And if there's any room for building plausible alternatives outside of looking through, say, that Western framework. Yeah. I mean, you know, the West is in some ways still very potent, very dominant, very hegemonic within the world. Demographically, certainly, the West becomes less and less and less capable of exerting its sense of its values and its sense of priorities or agenda on the rest of the world. I think one way to think about this is to think, in a sense, about the generations of ways in which people have approached this notion of reckoning with human difference over the course of the 20th century. You know, I think about the ways, for example, that in the United States, at least, people talked about pluralism in the early part of the 20th century as a way of imagining um, some notion, some account, some arrangement, some protocol of human difference. And pluralism was something that corresponded to imagining a United States that was being reformed by immigration. Also, pluralism was a way of beginning to take into account the aspirations of people in various parts of the world to become validated as kind of civil entities in the form of national societies, the sort of Wilsonian idea of emerging nationalisms all around the world asserting themselves in the wake of World War I. That gave way by World War II and particularly the sort of defeat of scientific racism in part because of the horror and the recoil to Nazism with a universalism a kind of humanistic universalism that became a different way of imagining the diversity of people. And that humanistic universalism imposed precisely, I think, that idea that there were a set of values that came out of the West. I think by the 1980s and the 1990s, what we think of as multiculturalism 
which has one sort of iteration in relation to thinking about a national society like the United States, but has a very different iteration in terms of thinking about globalization and the ways in which the shrinking of distance between people, whether through the internet, whether through jet travel, whether through the ways in which commerce and enterprise are drawing people together, that involves having to think about a world rather than a country, although of course I spoke very much about thinking about this issue in relation to national frames. We could certainly, I think, in terms of that notion of multiculturalism, understand it much more transnationally, internationally, even paranationally in terms of refusing nations as what it is that most defines and best defines the ways in which we think about people. So I think the sensibility that there's a reason to question the Western frame around this, I think is, is well put. Because in fact, the, the paradigm in a sense through which we begin to think about human difference is less and less one that is firmly rooted within a nation. You brought up this, uh, this idea around tradition, right? But you also brought up the fact that the university has a very you know, uh, troubled past. And I would also argue that the university's past is reflective of America's past in a lot of these issues. Mm -hmm. So where do you believe the word and the ideas behind tradition actually fall short? And to what extent, or what, what do you see on the limits of using tradition as this value that we like hold? Well, I think as long as we speak of traditions rather than tradition, then we're in a position where we begin to sort of have a little bit more room to maneuver. And at that point, the traditions of thinking about critique in relation to how institutions operated within cities like Chicago during the middle of the 20th century, the tradition of trying to find ways to disturb the premise that those that did not have naturalization in the United States had no rights, enjoyed no prerogatives in relation to living within this country. The tradition of critiquing the ways in which the United States understood itself as a philanthropic em em entity in the world, and yet at the same time had various kinds of imperial projects, including, of course, the Philippines, Puerto Rico, and a range of other areas that came under U.S. control and U.S. protected status as of the turn of the century. These are traditions too, but they are alternate traditions to a central tradition. And so in that sense, again, I think that the claim on values is an opportunity to claim the traditions that would be able to give us a clearer sense of what it is that we're talking when we're talking about dominant traditions whether it's a tradition of a certain sense of national exceptionalism, whether it's a tradition about the rule of law as being able to resolve all disputes, or whether it's a tradition of imagining that a universal norm can somehow best ground human beings in a right sense of relationship with one another. So I, I think we have to pluralize our sense of what it means both to be radical and to be conservative in relation to thinking about what it is that we're asserting through the paradigm of diversity. Okay, why don't we stop and perhaps we'll go ahead and move over to the next phase. Thank you very much, everybody. I look forward to talking further. This discussion is just one of the ways that the RISE Initiative is providing ongoing opportunities for dialogue about diversity and excellence across our campus. This particular dialogue will be facilitated by UChicago students who value dialogue as an opportunity to cultivate curiosity, growth, and understanding in our community. Please continue to check rise.uchicago.edu for more information on upcoming programs. If you're interested in being trained as a student facilitator, please let the staff know as you enter our conversation that we're gonna have in a couple of minutes. Professor Green will be joining us as well to take part in that conversation. Thank you all for joining us tonight uh, at our first ever annual RISE faculty lecture on diversity and excellence and hope to see you all in a few minutes in Hutchinson Commons. Have a great night.